All right, welcome guys to the David F. Haas podcast. I'm here with a good friend of mine that I just recently met, uh, Mickey Pittman. Uh, Mickey and I are members of a group together and Mickey reached out to me, um, which I believe was like karmic timing uh, because Mickey has helped me tremendously with respect to leadership in my companies. Uh, him and I have uh, mutual business interests and we kind of get together on a call once a week and talk about these things. And uh, I'm like, Mickey, you got to come on the podcast. So uh, Mickey, thanks, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy uh, to come on the podcast and uh, talk about uh, whatever we're going to talk about today. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man. So Mickey, uh, Mickey has a background in the military. Um, his leadership skills are like nothing I've ever heard of. And it, you remind me a lot of my buddy, Tony. We've talked about him that uh, was on the SWAT team. And he has a lot of that same leadership quality. And he's been able to build a great team. And, and I know that you um, have had that same experience. Uh, so why don't you just elaborate a little bit on um, where this leadership quality that you have uh, came from and, and how you got to where you're, you're at now? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, all I really wanted to do was uh, serve my country and, you know, become an army ranger one day. And so I had the opportunity to, to go and get a commission in the United States Army, I become an infantry officer and then go through the Airborne Ranger Schoolhouse. And so, you know, the Uni United States Army Ranger School is supposedly the most difficult leadership course in the world. And so uh, I was a first time graduate. It's uh, 64 days of uh, 20 hour days with one to two hours sleep and one meal a day and so you're averaging about 16 hours of physical activity you know one meal a day it gets crazy and um i went in there at like 195 pounds and probably 10 percent, maybe eight percent body fat really low and i graduated at 145 pounds and so um Jesus. it's crazy it's so difficult that near the end of the course uh the whole unit smells like ammonia and you'll literally be on the side of a mountain or in a jungle somewhere. And you'll be like, it sounds like my mom's cleaning the kitchen, you know? And it's because when your body has burned all its fat and has nothing left to burn but muscle, the byproduct of using muscle uh, to, as fuel is ammonia. And that's kind of how you know, that's how you know you're dying. <laughs> I've actually experienced that smell, uh, doing a lot of runs, long runs after I come back right. from those runs. So now I know that I'm, I'm losing muscle mass from those, those long runs when I'm going like uh, 30 kilometers or something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, man. So now uh, I know that you're involved with some restaurants and gyms. Like you got, you, you got, I thought I had a lot going on, but you, 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 you trump me on uh, what you have going on in your life. So like, what are you up to now? And uh, yeah, just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, great. So I got injured in the military up at uh, Fort Bragg, actually Camp McCall, which is home of the uh, U.S. Army Special Forces Training Complex. So it's where every future Green Beret uh, uh, goes through that schoolhouse, uh, Sears School, the famous Survive, Escape, Resist, Evade School founded by Nick Rowe is there. Uh, they have a big airfield there. We were practicing an airfield seizure, which is a, a type of, can be a type of special operations mission. And, uh, and something went wrong. And I had... I, bag went wrong. Like I blacked out when it hit the ground, didn't almost didn't know where I was and uh, couldn't feel anything from my waist down. And um, so here I am, I'm supposed to be the main effort for my unit that night. We're getting ready to do a big uh, pre-mission training, kind of full mission profile exercise. And, uh, and I can't feel anything, right? I don't even know if I can get up. And uh, so I'm kind of debating whether I call the radio and get an ambulance in, or, you know, can I, can I make my toes wiggle? And uh, the pain was so bad. I, my eyes were watering. Um, not, it was one of those things where, um, just the pain was so severe, but it was causing my night vision goggles to fog up. And, uh, I finally got them focused and, uh, could actually see, oh, my toes can move. And so at that point, you know, I was able to kind of took me a few minutes to get up. I shouldered my like 125 pounds of combat equipment and, and went out and did the mission. And, uh, and so what happened was I had fractured my C1 Atlas um it's sometimes called the widowmaker bone it, it's the bone that holds up your your head and uh but thankfully thank god i just fractured on one side if i'd fractured on both sides i'd be dead right and so um wow. and so i i, I uh, went on to deployment like that i, I did a, i did you know six more jumps in the military like that but over time it, i tried to hide it because you know um sometimes you get injuries like that you get kicked out of the unit you're in um, not because people hate you, just because you can't do the mission. And uh, I did it as long as I could. And then 
I, um, I bowed out. And uh, from there, uh, I went to Wall Street and taught leadership. So my last year on active duty, I went through this evaluation process and I was evaluated as one of the most effective leaders out of uh, Forcecom, USASOC, JSOC, the big three kind of tier one, tier two units um, in the military and it actually went my records. And so uh, I was able to go to Wall Street and uh, work with the uh, third largest bank in the world. And we built uh, what was really the world's first fully immersive leadership development platform. And um, a lot of people have seen a movie called The Game with Michael Douglas. It's an old school film, um, but basically it's where he pays a million dollars and kind of reality is turned on him uh, based on his psychological profile and personal history. They built scenarios out that actually helped him to become the person that he can be, right? And so that's what we did on Wall Street. And we actually built that um, for Wall Street executives because when you're on Wall Street, you might read a book on leadership, uh, you might hear a talk on leadership, but it doesn't mean you're gonna try it out because quite frankly, uh, you're betting hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And so you really have to believe in something. And so what we did was we created these almost alternate universes for these people. Um, where they could prove themselves to be leaders in much more difficult military scenarios. And so we would use hostage rescue missions or amphibious raids to do that. And from my time there, 9-11 um, happened. We, I went back and began building special operations training programs. And uh, I still do that to this day. And um, basically the story there is uh, about three or four years after 9-11, say the average SEAL team you know, has uh, X amount of assigned operators to it. And usually they take the most experienced guys and make them the training cadre. Probably by 2004, 2005, some of these units uh, really struggled to find um, training cadre. Everyone that was in uniform had to be in uniform. And so they start, started hiring veteran um, military personnel, special operators, whatever, whatever it be the case. And so we built training programs for just some of the best units in the world. We did some really fun uh, really effective training evolutions. And um, so I can't talk about who we did that specifically for, um, but we did it, you know, for the military community. And, uh, um, and that brought me into uh, becoming a small business owner. And so I was coaching uh, and doing that kind of stuff. And some guys found out about my background and said, Hey, would you be willing to work with us? And that led me to becoming a restaurateur. So, yeah, so we, we got, we started four restaurants in the last seven years and uh, those, those are called burger fries. I don't think they're in Canada yet, maybe one or two. Uh, oh. We've got them in mostly the Eastern seaboard of the United States and in London, places like that. Uh, and, uh, and then I got invited to become a partner in a medical device company. And so we just published a paper, in fact, on how we were able to help, you know, special operators become more effective through breathing training. And so uh, currently we're doing a big project with Mayo Clinic uh, because the respiratory muscular training we do helps athletes, it helps hockey players, it helps football players, baseball players. Um, it helps, you know, weekend warriors, but it also helps it potentially, I can't say also yet, it potentially also helps people recovering from uh, COVID-19 complications. And so we're doing a big study right now with Mayo. And, um, and so, yeah, then I have my own kind of coaching business and, you know, I do, do a few other hobbies out there. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. So, so the question that I know everyone's thinking, because what I'm thinking is like, where do you find the time to do all this stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it comes from my background. Uh, you know, the military does this pretty well. I think the U United States Army Ranger School does this really well. And so a lot of people talk about leadership. Um, and I think sometimes they're talking about control. You know, sometimes people say, I want to be a leader. What they're really saying is, I want to be in control. And the most effective organizations and the most effective leaders out there are not trying to control people they're trying to empower people. And so uh, I teach and I believe a really decentralized form of execution. It's when you really give people the power to, to, to be uh, free to think, to free to, free to try things, free to experiment, that they kind of take ownership and they actually accomplish more. And so it's not me trying to control a bunch of things. It's actually me trying to, number one, I try to serve others. And so uh, I find people that, that I can serve. And when I serve others, it just, it, it gains you influence. It gains you credibility. Um, we were just talking about this on a different subject. You know, it, it gains you also um, um, what I call leadership credit. And leadership credit is when you serve someone authentically. And just as a result of you doing that, they're willing to help you out. 
you know, they're willing to, 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 to come alongside you. And so, so what I do is I'm a, I'm a strategist, trained strategist, but also um, it's really what I, I love. I love strategy. And so um, I try to use strategy to get things done as opposed to me trying to be um, uh, uh, a, a manipulator, a controller, a micromanager. And so I try to empower people. One of my uh, mentors from afar, he's, he's a good guy by the name of uh, Jack Singlob, still alive today. Uh, he parachuted behind enemy lines from World War II um, to work with the uh, Free French and the Partisans. Um, so some, some have seen that kind of famous movie um, uh, by uh, Brad Pitt, um, you know, the, the Inglorious Bastards, I oh, think yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, that was about the OSS. And so I actually got to interview and learn from one of uh, the original members of that group. And um, he retired, I think is a three-star general's name, Jack Singlob, you can look him up, wrote a book called Hazardous Duty. And so I was at his place uh, uh, up in DC and had a chance to interview him for a book project, a, leadership, a book on leadership that I'm writing. And uh, I said, sir, tell me the one thing you would want, you know, leaders to know. Like when you became, uh, he, he was head of something called Mac VSOG in Vietnam, which is the precursor to the SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force. And these guys were legendary operators and just got things done and just did the craziest missions um, that SEAL people have never heard of. He led that whole group. And, uh, and so he had quite the extensive career. And he said, Mickey, the one thing I've learned, um, if you want to be an effective leader, you know, you have to underwrite the mistakes of your subordinates. And so um, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, here's the bottom line. Uh, you can't give subordinates a chance to fail in a such a way that it destroys your company or your organization. He says, so as a leader, you have to strategically think through what it means to give your people certain tasks, to give them ownership of certain things so that potentially if they succeed, they're going to raise and uh, raise up their leadership ability. They're going to rise in stature. And if they fail, that you can underwrite it and wipe off the slate. He said, when someone fails below you, if you crush them, they'll never want to work for you again and word will spread. He goes, but someone fails for you, if they're actually trying their best, if you wipe off the slate, pick them up, then you'll have someone that will be in your corner the rest of your life, right? And so he says, smart leaders underwrite the mistakes of their subordinates. And so that's what I try to do. I try to put people in the right positions, give them the right tools, and then empower them um, to accomplish a mission, task, or purpose. Yeah, and I, I, as you were talking there, I wrote down like, um, you know, what do you think the one one thing is that most business owners are missing about leadership? Uh, but I think I kind of answered my own question as, as I was listening to you is that you have to empower people, you know, and, uh, you know, when you you answer the question of how do you find the time to do that? And it's because you're, you know, you've empowered people all around you. Right. And uh, because of that, it gives you the opportunity to do a bunch of things. You know, um, if you try and control every element of every every task, you're going to be you're going to be you know stuck in a very small box of what you can actually accomplish. Right. So, um, you know, you and I were just having that conversation from your, your advice and guidance. Um, I was talking about my team and uh, and uh, we, you, one of the things you said is that you got to make it really clear on what it is you want from them. Right. And so that's what I did. And I said, you know, we're going to run this ad campaign. And um, I gave them a three thousand dollar budget. I said, hey, this is what I plan on doing with this budget. And because of that, they were like empowered. They were like, yeah. And they came back to me that this list and they made these Bristol boards of all the things that they're going to do. And, and I was just like, yeah, it's all amazing. And then I could see the energy and the shift and there was no real shift in uh, money. I gave them a little bit of incentive on any sales that come in from it, but like no real shift in money it was more about, it wasn't about the financial incentive. It was about the, Hey, this is your project. That's right. Like, uh, and they're like I'm just going to be there to support you. And, and for me, the thing that's shifted for me, you know, I've been in business since I was 16 and I've had employees since I was 16. The thing, the thing that's shifted for me after meeting you, which is, is, is like I said, it's like, it was so karmically aligned that you and I, like, you know, we're in a, we're in a group chat of 250 people. And then you message me like, and say, Hey, uh, you want to get together on a call every now and then? I'm like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I just said, well, there was no question in my mind. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And it was just like, uh, uh, there was just so much that I've received from knowing you. And I was like, this is exactly what I was missing in my life was like this, this leadership element of things. Right. And so what, what I'm learning is that um, one is universe, God, whatever is always going to provide you everything that you need. 
And uh, yeah. you and I meeting was a testament to that. Now I haven't figured out what I'm going to provide to you yet, but uh, it's coming. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, but the other thing is, is that, uh, is that I think what most business owners are missing is that they need to become the servant of their, the, the people that work for them. So yeah. instead, so that's exactly what I said to my team. I said, instead of me constantly saying, this is what I need from you. I want to empower them and say, and I want them to ask me what they need from me in order to be able to make uh, this task, uh, you know, come to life. And that's ex- like literally exactly what happened with like that one conversation. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add on to that um, with respect to like, cause I don't think a lot of business owners are actual leaders. I'll tell you the absolute truth. Like I think they're leaders in the sense of they're the alpha, you know, uh, usually of their group. And, but I don't think they're leaders as far as like, I like the word empowerment almost more than leader because when we think of leader, we think of the boss, right? Uh, and that, that, that might be something for you right there. Mickey, I just gave to you is that, that, cause I think the, the word leadership has gotten beaten to death and I don't even, I don't think people even connect with what leadership really is. I think we associate leadership with, um, being the boss, right? But it's really about power. Yeah. Like, now, when you say empowerment, it's like I'm empowering my employees to, to take charge and to own up to their mistakes and own up to their their uh, their wins. That that's is right. a, a completely different word, you know, and uh, that's right. the, that's what I took away from from getting to know you is like, oh, I got to empower people all around me. And man, it's been it's been amazing. And I barely even implemented it. And like, uh, you know, you know, I only been on a call once a week here for the last couple of months and mm-hmm. it's made a dramatic shift in in my business. And, uh, the other thing that I'm, I want to add here too, is like one of the, the conversations that I had with my manager, uh, at the restaurant, I was like, and this, and I truly t- totally believe this. Cause when you said this to me, I was like, yeah, that hit the nail on the head. It's like, whatever it is you want to do, I'm here to support you. Mm-hmm. So if you want to go and run your own bar restaurant one day, I'll, I'll help you do that. Right? Right. If you want to buy this restaurant for me, I'll help you do that. If you want to stay here and make 110 K, K a year, I'll help you do that too. Right. It's like, whatever it is, I'm here to help and support you. So, um, yeah, I, that was the shift that happened for me. I don't know if you want to add anything to this conversation about what business owners are missing about, about leadership, which is empowerment. (laughs) Uh, but maybe there's more because you have so much knowledge. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think the first thing, and you know, I have a friend, uh, he is the, uh, PhD kind of clinical organizational psychologist helps select all kind of modern day army special forces operators. And, uh, and he and I talked about this a lot and, and, and the phrase that we've come up with, and I really should say he's come up with, but I've adopted it would be that um, to be successful long-term, you have to have what's called a mastery orientation. And a mastery orientation is someone who doesn't think they're an expert at anything, but they desire expertise. And there's a big shift. Mm. Right. I love that. And so, you know, I, I spent a little time in the military. There's, I have friends that have spent 34 plus years, you know, I've got a good buddy I work with, you know, he's got a thousand different raids against Al Qaeda and, and ISIS, a thousand raids. I mean, unbelievable. He's got so much experience. And so in that context, I do not consider myself, you know, the classic special operator. I mean, I'm an infantry officer, airborne ranger qualified. I, I, I got hurt on the path of kind of rising up in that. And I think that made me hungry um, to kind of evaluate the, the, the ratings that I did get, how did I get them? And then kind of what could I learn from them? And so part of that uh, is being humble and teachable. And, um, and so I've spent quite a few years trying to figure out what allowed me to operate at a level kind of higher than I, I should have. And the overwhelming consensus uh, uh, there's two, there's two things that allow me to do that. The first was being humble. I found mentors who were ahead of me in the journey and I learned everything I, I could from them. And I think some people are really stuck with trying to be know-it-alls. And um, maybe, maybe it was Ronald Reagan that said it um, that I remember, but um, he probably didn't invent it. You know, uh, he said, you know, I, I, I want to be the dumbest person in a room, Right. He goes, I want to surround myself with smart people. I try to do that. And I really try to learn from others. And the second is I try to have a teachable spirit. Uh, I really, I can, I tell people all the time, I can learn from anyone, anywhere, any place. Right. Now, I also, you can see some books, you know, I, my, 
my wife is probably most mad about my book collection that overflows in almost every room of our house, including our garage. I mean, I mean our, our cars are parked outside because of all the, all the boxes of books. Um, you know, but my mentor uh, is someone by the name of uh, General David Grange, probably um, one of the most legendary special operators uh, still alive today. He, he, he was a founder of some special mission units and commander of the same for the Ranger Regiment. And, and uh, he and I have built training programs for and, and, and arms companies and stuff like that for, for quite some time together. And, and what he says is, he says it differently. Be humble and teachable. He says, you know, you got to keep one foot in the library, kind of one foot in the field. And, um, and basically, that whole kind of piece of this conversation just means keep an open perspective. And uh, don't consider yourself king of any hill, right? Uh, I think Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. And uh, he called it the genius with a thousand idiots model. And he said he would find business owners or CEOs who thought they knew it all. And um, really, people who know it all are just really insecure people when it comes down to it. And so um, they would surround themselves with, with people that would never um, be good enough to take their spot. And as a, as a consequence, as long as they were in charge, that company would do well. But the company always had a rise and it had a fall, right? Long-term sustainable growth um, is really a derivative of, of hiring the right kinds of people. And, uh, and so when you think about it, hiring the right kinds of people mean that uh, when you hire someone, um, they want to be around you. Um, uh, they want to be with you. They want to work for you. And it can never be about money or position, right? It's something John Maxwell calls a level five leader. It's really about your personhood and what kind of people you attract around you. Yeah, I love that. And I'm glad you answered the question about the books too, because that was going to be one of the questions I asked you. It's like, you got all those books in your, <laughs> on your shelves back there. It's like, how, how many, uh, how, how much do you read? Like, are you reading a book a week or what, what is it that you're doing? Like, I probably read, I, I, I consume information um, because now some of it's digital, some of it's on a Kindle, you know, but, but mm -hmm. I, I try to average two to three books a week. Two to three books a week. Jeez. I try. I'm not saying I always, always hit it, but um, you know, I, I, um, I try to dedicate time uh, every day. There's a, uh, I'm a, I'm a novice student of, of something called a Zettel casting system. And um, the more you study, you know, everyone loves social media, everyone loves digital marketing, but the more you get into it, the more you realize it's all about content, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you get into um, learning how to build influence on platforms, now there's, 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 you know, kind of, as that famous poet said, you know, a, a poet said a, a road diver, r diverged in the yellow wood and went too fast. And there's a path on social media, which is, you know, skin and sex and that kind of stuff. And sure, you don't need to have any content except for the for the, you know, Im for imageries to kind of get influenced there. But what, what are you really influencing, right? I mean, you're nothing I'm kind of really interested in. The other kind of influence is where you're developing influence through serving others. And that really comes through helping people along a path. And so what I've learned is in order to be a coach to someone or to coach effectively, uh, to lead someone effectively, you don't have to be six steps ahead of them. You just kind of need to be one step ahead of them, right? And uh, and so Zettelkasten is a system invented by a famous German sociologist. And it's just a way of reading consistently and taking notes consistently. And so the short of it is uh, the guy who founded that system, he on average, right? He took uh, six notes a day on note cards. And, um, and, uh, and over, over a 30 year career, he wrote something like 70 published books. And he did something like 3000 published scientific articles. Crazy. And so they, had, they said, how'd you do it? He goes, in the evenings, I would read while my family's watching TV. I took six of these a day. And, um, and, and through that, over time, it's just like saving. It's just like investing long term, right? That compounding effect. Um, and so I, if I read, uh, you know, 20, 30 pages a day, sometimes 40, 50, depends on, you know, what it is, then I'm going to consistently work through um, information. I'm going to glean, glean information from it. And then what I found is um, if I organize that effectively up here to a degree, you're limited there, but more effectively put it to a system that I can capture, then I find that people pick up the phone and call me and ask me questions, you know? And so I, I demonstrate value by either having an answer 
finding an answer quickly or pointing, some, pointing someone toward an answer. And um, in the military, uh, I always wanted to be the best, right? I mean, I worked really hard at it. But what I eventually learned is, is that only others can determine you to be the best. Think about in America, American football, Tom Brady, you know, GOAT, greatest of all time. Uh, no one would like Tom if he, you know, if he did, I'm the greatest of all time. I mean, you know, that kind of that Muhammad Ali fashion. I mean, if you're going to, maybe, mm -hmm. um, but really it's a determination that someone else has to make about you. The one thing you can do for yourself is you can determine to be the hardest worker, right? And so if anyone that's listening or watching this podcast and no matter what you want to do, if you want to have a military career, political career, business career, nonprofit career, doesn't matter. If you want to gain stature and influence, um, work hard, find something that you're passionate enough about that you have the skills and talent for that, that your work will pay off and, and get after it. And if you do that, people will recognize that and they'll want you around. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll add to that in a little bit and, and saying like, cause I think you, in some ways you do work, you are working hard, but in some ways you're not like when you say, you know, you got all these books behind you that you've read and you say, well, you know, I basically read 30 to 50 pages a night. Right. It's like not that hard to do that, right? right. But it's that consistency that people are missing, sure. right? And I, yeah. I know because I've been down this road. Like uh, I, pretty much all of my books that I read are all on uh, iPad or I'm listening to them now. So it's like I don't have the shelf, but my shelf would be nowhere near as big as yours. I know that. Um, um, but I think what happens, and I because I've experienced this myself, is like I'll finish a book and then – two or three weeks might go by before I start reading the next, you know, like, Oh, I haven't downloaded it or I haven't done whatever. I haven't gone to the store and bought it. And, you know, I think I, my guess is you're the kind of guy that probably has like five books that you're, uh, that are on deck that are going to, you're going to read next. Kind of thing. Right, right, <laughs> right? Right, right. Yeah. Right. So it's like oh, yeah. one goes down one night, you know, you finish this and then the next one comes up and you're already done. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, no, I know. No doubt. Yeah. So and for, go ahead. And for me, I, I, I think it's smart. I, I just have a curiosity um, about things. And I, I think, it, um, you know, it's, um, it's, I'm I also, I don't want to learn the hard way. Right. I mean, the older you get, I've earned this gray hair. Um, learning lessons your own way, right. Through experience is the best teacher, you know, but it's also the hardest teacher. And so, you know, the, the longer I've lived, the, the less I want to figure out things for myself. So, I like to say you can either learn from your mistakes or you can learn from the mistakes of others. Either way, you're going to learn. Right. And so um, I would rather learn from the mistakes of others. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I do. I mean, one of the things I, I kind of I teach is that, you know, everything that I coach my clients on is all from experience. <laughs> and, right. and and I had my mentor at the time saying, you know, and yeah, there was obviously the knowledge that I, I obtained by reading books I've been reading business back in the day was business books, but uh, you know, sure. since I was really young. Um, but I had my mentor basically saying like, don't go this way because it's going to cause you all this grief. You know, like I, I can specifically remember uh, I went into like the, the real estate game and I was, I owned uh, a couple, uh, two fourplexes and, and those things were the bane of my existence, literally. And he told me, he's like, it's like, do you want to be a restaurateur or do you want to be a, uh, you know, a real estate agent, essentially, right? You know, like a real estate uh, investor. And I was like, well, I can do both. Like, uh, and it's like, well, no, it was like, I couldn't. And he could see it. He right. could foresee all the problems. And I ended up selling them and not uh, probably losing money on them. And, and, and so I could have taken his advice, but I had to learn it on my own, right? And so, uh, yeah, it's like, I think, though, the more you learn and the more you, you become humble and the more you become teachable, right you're more likely to put that advice into place that you hear from a mentor or you read, sure. read in a book. Yeah. You know, I think it's, there's a, um, a great scene from that movie gladiator, right? Hmm. I just sort of watched that again last night. Yeah. And there's, there's a scene where there's a really strong warrior. Um, he, you know, he's a, he's a slave. because He's a gladiator. He's a really big guy can handle himself. And the, the, the fights escalate to where now they're, I think they're reenacting like a Peloponnesian war or something like that. And so they're like, Hey, you know, we're, you're, we're going to be the Romans in this scenario. And so these chariots are surrounding them and, and, uh, you know, Russell Crowe, um, you know, uh, Maximus, uh, says, Hey, if we stick together, 
if we stay as a unit, stay as a team, we're going to make it through it. If we don't, they're going to tear us apart. And the, and the big guy, you know, said, I don't need you guys and runs out and quickly gets, you know, arrow in the calf and he's going down, he's going to die. And, you know, and, and, and Russell Crowe moves that team around him, grabs him back in and they, they went right by, by being a unit, by locking arms. And, um, you know, we like to say there is no Lone Ranger, right? And, um, you know, in the Navy SEALs, it's called a swim buddy. In, in Ranger School, it's called a Ranger buddy. And uh, you don't go anywhere without them. You don't do anything without them. Your, your success is their success. Their success is yours. Um, you know, and, um, and you learn the power of teamwork and really of depending upon others. And so it's just not the military, though. It's just life. I mean, it, you know, I'm watching a series right now with my family called Undercover Billionaire. Mm. And uh, my son just graduated college and he's, you know, he's working for a startup and doing really well. And he, but during graduation, we went up to the University of Florida and he's like, hey, watch this TV show with me. And I don't watch a lot of TV, but, you know, obviously if your kid says watch it, you know, but I checked it out. It was a story of a billionaire. Um, they stripped him of his name. They kind of hid his identity like undercover boss. They gave him a hundred bucks and an old truck. And he had 90 days um, to go from one truck, no name, uh, and a hundred bucks with a cell phone and to, to, to becoming a millionaire through a business evalu evaluation. And, um, and so uh, he did it or close to it the first season. And then the second season, now features Grant Cardone and, um, and a couple other entrepreneurs. And it's just fantastic because to a person, all of them say, all of them, these are billionaire, you know, very successful people. They say, you know what? I can't do this alone. And, um, and they recognize the power of teams and, and they recognize they didn't get there by themselves. And so, you know, that's really important. And so that's why serving others matters. And that's why being teachable and humble matters. You know, it's, it's um, because when you fall, right, you want others to be around you to pick you up. And, um, and so you can be a know-it-all, I guess. You can try that. I would much rather be the kind of guy that, um, that when I stumble, I've got people to lock arms with me and, you know, uh, help me get there. 100%. And I, I think, you know, I know that you got to run and I think that's like uh, what I want to leave this podcast on is because this is what I think. And, and this is Mickey. This is why I know that you're, you're going to be like uber successful at what you're doing. And I know you got a lot of projects on the go, but like, this is like what I really think is what has been missing in business development. Like for so long, it's like, yeah, people are talking about leadership, but like, it's just like, I, maybe you're, maybe you hear it more than I do because I, I just started tuning my radar into this, but like, mm -hmm. I just feel like so many people are focused on like, like make money success. And, and they're forgetting about this one critical element. And, and I watched undercover billionaire, you, you turned me on to the show. And the one thing that they do, the first thing they do when they get to wherever they are is they start making contact with people. They start developing relationships. They start putting people around them. Right. right. It's like, none of them did it on their own. They all had these huge teams that they built. Right. And so it's like, I think that I know this is like critical and I, I'm, I'm going to, I can already see the Instagram post that I'm going to make out of this, <laughs> this, this, uh, this podcast is like, this is what's, what's missing in business. It's like, no one's talking about this because it's not as glorious in some regards, you know, right. you know, but then if you watch the movie gladiator, I mean, Russell Crowe had all the glory in the world at the end of that, that <laughs> show. Right. And he was the leader who, who lifted people up. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's what I think it is. And I, I, I know that uh, if, if any, I have a lot of people that are business owners that, that listen to the podcast, and I know that they're, they're going to have huge takeaways from this. So if, if any of those people want to get in contact with you, how, how could they reach you? Um, and what are you currently doing? Are you coaching people one-on-one -on -one still? Or what do, you, what do you got going on? Yeah, so I do, I, yeah, I, I do a little bit of coaching. And uh, I've got a website um, we just built. Uh, post pandemic or some people are still in the pandemic, I guess um, called the ethos leader. And it's just all about the warrior ethos and, you know, how to raise uh, your leadership ability. So they can go to the ethos And yeah, right on. Well, Mickey, uh, thanks for taking the time uh, to come on the podcast. We got to, we got to do this again, man, for sure, because you, you got a ton of value uh, to offer to everyone. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to spend with Thanks me. brother. Yeah. Have a great day. All right. You too, man. And don't forget if you haven't already, uh, every single Wednesday, I'm releasing a new podcast. If you haven't clicked that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. And we'll see you again next Wednesday.